been in Afghanistan and Iraq for such a long period of time, and there was enough empirical evidence, even from the first Gulf War and from our invasion in Panama in 89, that women did perfectly fine. So it begs the question, why 2015 and why not earlier? And you know, I'll put 74 on there for, for a particular reason, but I'll, I'll get to that later on, though. And then moving on to slide 15. Uh, this is an historical overview. So what I roughly just wanted to, to emphasize, because women's role with the armed forces has been very complicated and it's changed dramatically over the years. Uh, during the Civil War and up to World War I, generally women were considered civilian augments, so they would uh, help out as nurses and as physicians and as typists and clerks, but they would very rarely be actually in the armed forces or in uniform. And that changes dramatically in World War II, given the, the scope of mobilizations required for the United States to fight in this conflict. And so what ends up happening is women, in addition to doing what they had done before as doctors and as nurses or, or whatever else, they do a lot of jobs that include flying, they become mechanics, uh, they, they drive heavy vehicles and so on and so forth. And moving on to slide 16, there's a different image on here which really highlights how the military viewed women and that was that their role was to free up men. So sure, women could fly aircraft, but they were gonna fly aircraft in the United States so men had to fly aircraft so men could be freed up to, to fly aircrafts in, in the Pacific or in, in the European theater. And then moving on to slide 17, typically what would happen after conflicts is that just like with the American Armed Forces in general after conflicts before the Cold War, you would mobilize and demobilize and have fewer uh, folks in, in the armed forces. The view initially was that women were also going to be completely removed from the armed forces. However, the, the Cold War kind of changes those dynamics. In 1948, Congress passes a law, uh, the Women's Armed Services Integration Act which formalizes having women permanently in the armed forces, in addition to the larger scope of keeping a large peacetime army, which is new in the United States. And women are also capped. They can't be more than, I think it's 3.5% of the overall armed forces. They can't be promoted above colonel. Uh, they can't have uh, men under their command when they are officers and so on and so forth. So they're kind of put in this auxiliary role where they're not allowed to do a lot of things. There's a lot of arguments that even come up from um, even people like Eisenhower who articulate that having women in uniform is substantially better because unlike civil servants who go home at five o'clock, someone in uniform is on call 24 hours a day. So there's even like this kind of awkward tension where there's an abuse of, of like one's labor in here. Uh, moving on to slide 18, um, what kind of changes this dynamic? Women are kept in these auxiliary roles or they're capped or they're promotable, they're capped in their jobs, they're kept in very few areas. The, the end of the draft changes that. And we don't, the draft changes, for, as many of you know, primarily because of the unpopularity of the Vietnam War. And the armed forces in Congress have a very large debate about what they're gonna do about that. And the concept is, well, let's shift over to an all volunteer force. And we'll pay them better, we'll give them uh, specific allowances, we'll free up benefits, we'll make more flexible enlistment contracts, and so on and so forth. And what you then get is a flood of more women in the armed forces because there's not enough men who want to join on their own free will and accord in the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and the Marine Corps. I'm going on to slide 18. So I put this up. This is one of the academic slides that I decided to keep in here. There's a lot of stuff that's a little thick. But what I wanted to highlight is in the 70s, it almost seems like common sense to us today that women are able to do these jobs. And so therefore, just let them do it, you know, free it up. And when the draft ends, there's very few excuses. There's also a lot of tension because what precisely people in academics and women's movements in general articulate about what's essential to women? Like what are their roles in society? What's appropriate for them? There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of back and forth that complicates the ability to have a, a meaningful rationalized policy. And some of this has to deal with these two different competing camps of feminism. Uh, one of this is the ethic of justice which articulates a, a kind of a liberal view of, of women's rights. Same potential as men, same obligations, but also these implications for citizenship. Uh, First-class citizenship is what it's typically called. And the idea is that if you're not fit, if you're not allowed to, to fight and potentially even die for the Republic, then you're not like at that same level of citizenship. And this comes up quite frequently in, in issues regarding African-Americans when they're serving in the Civil War, wars before, wars after, and especially in World War I, World War II. Uh, this other one, the ethic of care, this is also a, a feminist school of thought. 
that tends to align that women are inherently different, that they're more aligned to be more peaceful, they're more nurturing. And as, as mothers, and as, uh, as mothers, they're the bringers, not the takers of life. So a variety of conservatives, but even liberals in the United States have a difficult time uh, conceptualizing what precisely the role for women is. Moving on to slide 20, I added this here too. Um, within the 80s, it also gets complicated. For those of you who are familiar with the Equal Rights Amendment, when that came up, there was a huge counter pushback on that. Uh, so you combine that with uh, especially anti-war movements from, from uh, the Vietnam War era, this debate on women's rights, uh, third wave feminism and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a difficult debate to, to tackle. Uh, slide 21, to kind of uh, emphasize this, because I don't want to suggest that women are inherently different and therefore they're, they're treated differently, but I, I, I try to bring up that, this, that these two competing feminist logics, one were same rights, same responsibilities, and one of ethic of care, these both have very deep roots that are meaningful and produce a lot of good things in society. So uh, nuclear zero movements, uh, or uh, protests against the Vietnam War, even the uh, anti-personnel landmine um, treaty, which was advocated by Jody Williams uh, and it solidified banning anti-personnel mines across the world. These all are done by organizations that are run by, led by, and primarily uh, staffed by, by women who have a particular view of, you know, as mothers, as daughters, here is our view of the world and here are things that we want to do. Moving on to slide 23, there's a bunch of stuff I tackled into here. And so what this institutional changes means is, so how do we approach and understand precisely how this change happens, given all these constraints, given these competing logics of, of, feminist, of feminism and what the roles of women are? Well, it starts with changes in Congress that are really, really meaningful. It almost seems common sense to think, well, the president says changes for rule and it happens. Well, because Congress is the way it is and the powers it has over the armed forces, change has to happen there. Uh, slide 24. This is just a very crude graph. I put this up to kind of highlight that something very important changes in the 80s and especially in the 90s after the Anita Hill uh, hearing, that you get a lot more women running, running for and winning U.S. House and Senate seats. So you get a lot more women in Congress. Uh, specifically, on slide 25, there's two vigils I identify that are really, really key. Uh, Pat Schroeder, hopefully some of you remember her. Uh, she's from Colorado, and Bev Byron, she was from Maryland. Uh, both these women are, are very powerful in Congress, and they almost kind of lie low for a number of years. They get in, they, um, they, they get themselves into important seats like the, um, the House Armed Services Committee. And before 92, you had very few women in these roles. And these women are very vocal, they're very important, and they're, they're very proactive. And going on to the next slide, so there's a, another kind of variable that affects how this policy change. In 1989, for those of you who remember this, when we're going after Noriega, the US invades Panama. And you have someone in particular, Captain Linda Bray. She's in charge of a military police company. She's the first woman to lead troops into combat. But what happens with her, though, is the, the military says, hey, um, Captain Bray, take this dog kennel. We're going to turn into supply depot. There's no one there. You'll be fine. But when Bray gets there, her and her company end up having to fight a bunch of Panamanian soldiers. And in the course of doing so, we wind up with this, this unexplainable uh, event where everyone says women aren't able, they're not physically able to do this, they're going to ruin you know, cohesion, they don't, they don't belong there. But Captain Bray is perfectly fine. There's also a couple other individuals, these um, a lieutenant and warrant officer who are both helicopter pilots in Panama, and they're, they're flying non-combat aircraft, but they get shot at, they do evasive maneuvers, and they perform admirably. And, and they're, um, they're given uh, awards for valor for it. Well, the, what I mentioned before was these people in Congress, including Pat Schroeder, Schroeder sees this happen and says, you gotta be kidding me. Like we've been saying women can't do these jobs. Clearly women are doing the jobs, so let's change the law. Unfortunately, the, the bill doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Uh, on slide 27, the Gulf War uh, shows this dynamic, but in a substantially larger example. There's 37,000 women, um, more than that actually, that, that are deployed to the Persian Gulf to, to help uh, the US overall invasion that ousts Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Uh, some of those women are killed, some of them are wounded, and some of them are even taken prisoner. And what this does is this gives the, the American public a lot of imagery and a lot, and a lot of norms and values and beliefs have to be kind of re-questioned in some degree. So on slide 28, this is a very crude graph. It's difficult to, um, 
to have these done so that they're um, weighed against each other. But nevertheless, what, I, what I'm trying to show you here though is when these conflicts occur, so 1989 on that scale, before then, when people were asked, that green line is fair ability. When, when there's polling that is asked, women, asked the American public, uh, do you support women being able to fight in combat? It's usually around a third, and that's if it's generous. That's pretty constant for a long period of time. But after Bray and as those pilots, and after these women in the Persian Gulf are, are in these roles where technically they're in support jobs, they're not in combat jobs, but they inadvertently wind up in combat anyway, and they do perfectly fine, their ability actually goes up quite a bit, 60%, and then drops again a little bit after the Gulf War. And that blue line shows media coverage. So in the past, like that little tick in 1980, that's the ERA there. So a lot of groups were countering the ERA saying you don't want your mothers and daughters to be drafted and have to fight in war. But the, the, the much larger tick occurs because the media is curious about these two puzzles, about people like Captain Bray and about the 37,000 women who are in the Persian Gulf. On slide 29, this is a very specific example of, of someone's opinion changing, and someone that's actually rather important. So those of you who remember the Vietnam War, Westmoreland was the overall American commander in the latter years of the war. And his opinion in the 70s about women uh, being allowed to fight in combat is kind of related to opening up West Point admissions to women, the US Military Academy. And Westmoreland, his mindset is, yeah, maybe one in 10,000 women could do this kind of job, but she'd be a freak, so we shouldn't allow them to do this stuff. And then over time, his view kind of moderates. He's still opposed to having women in combat, but he at least compliments them, and he's uh, you know, okay with them going to West Point in the, in the uh, late 80s. Another example on the next slide on, on 30, this is a, a Marine general. The Marine Corps is substantially more conservative than the other branches. Uh, general Drought has a, a change of heart because his daughter wants to become um, a, an aviator in the, in the Navy, specifically on combat aircraft. He's part of a commission in the 90s that is supposed to study this phenomenon. And he's quite frankly blunt about that. And his daughter being in that role changes his mind, at least uh, only partially though. Uh, when asked, but, what would happen if your daughter was shot down and become a POW? And he says, you know, I don't care if my daughter wants to do it. I want the Navy to have the best, and she's one of the best. But when asked about ground combat, though, Drought has a more nuanced view and still isn't that supportive. But you can see that his mind, is, his beliefs, and his, and his values are beginning to change. On slide 31, uh, this is just kind of highlighting that in the 90s, there's a surge in congressional activity. Uh, they needed Hill hearings kind of create a... Uh, a catalyst that brings more women into Congress. There's a commission in the 90s that's kind of packed and it's complicated, so I'm gonna skip over that. And then you have people like Pat Schroeder and Bev Byron who are still pushing. They see these opportunities, they see these changes, and actually they succeed in, one, in a couple of areas, and that is in the, the early 90s, the Air Force is forced to drop its ban on, on not allowing women to fly combat aircraft. The Navy opens up a lot of surface combat ships to women. But there's still limitations in the Army and the Marine Corps, and then even within the Special Forces and the, and the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, moving on to uh, let's skip 32 and 33 and go to 37. After 94, for those of you who remember the Newt Gingrich years, there's uh, the contract with America and the House flips. And what's really important to, to highlight on this, not that there's this, not, not that, aside from the fact that Congress changes you know, hands during the Clinton administration, but that the people that are in Congress in the post-94, they were a lot more hostile to, to women being in combat. But the fact that these changes have happened already, and the fact that women are there, they almost become irreversible. And it's difficult for them to, to change those policies because the Army and the Air Force and the Marines and Navy they take ownership of that and say the women are here now, we need them in those roles, and they do really well in those roles. And then also between, so essentially between 93 and 2004, there's virtually no activity uh, in Congress that addresses women in combat. On slide 38, um, this just kind of skims ahead to a different era. Similar to Panama and the Gulf War, the war on terror really brings to bear the issue about women in combat because women, again, who are in support roles, who are not technically in combat positions, they wind up in combat anyway, especially in Iraq where there's no clear front line. Uh, people in, in supply units, people in quartermaster units and transportation units, they wind up in combat anyway. 
And so the individual that's pictured there is uh, Sergeant Hester. She was a, a National Guards, or still is a National Guards woman and a military policewoman, who's decorated for valor, receives a silver star. But in, a, in these wars though, women are, are they're killed, they're wounded just like their male counterparts. Again, there's no front lines. And also even the logic of, of difference becomes really, really apparent. Uh, you have these, uh, these things called lioness teams or female engagement teams or cultural engagement teams in Iraq and Afghanistan, where commanders, including special forces commanders, start to realize that they can't do their job if there aren't women with the men uh, in those units. Because when male soldiers need to search you know, uh, female, uh, females in Iraq or Afghanistan, it, it offends the cultural sensibilities and can cause issues. On top of that, the inability to talk with half the population limits the amount of intelligence that the armed forces can get. So on slide 39, this is actually a picture of a couple of gals who were in one of those cultural engagement teams. And the military begins to find value in this. And actually, the, strangely enough, the military in, in a, Afghanistan and Iraq, they're in defiance of congressional law. What they, they are essentially saying that women aren't technically assigned to the units, they're attached to the units, so we're in compliance, but we aren't. And on top of that, you get more exposure to the public of women doing these jobs and doing perfectly fine. As in addition to the, to the differences they have that make them really, really valuable on the, on the battle space. Uh, on slide 40, this is actually a picture of uh, Tammy Duckworth. Those of you who know her, she's an amazing woman. But I also like to think that when you have people like this, uh, Duckworth was uh, a helicopter pilot and was shot down in, in combat and survived the crash and, and lost both her legs in the process and, and did an amazing job in recovery, quite frankly. Like, I like to imagine that when people like her are on the Senate floor, that it becomes really, really hard for even the most conservative male senators to say that you know, women don't belong in combat. They don't belong in these roles in the armed services. Because not only are individual women overseas doing the jobs and doing well, but that women like Duckworth are physically on the Senate floor and probably make it much more difficult to, to push back. And in 2005, you get a lot more activity, especially from people like Duckworth. So you've kind of left the the era where Bev, Schroeder, or Bev Byron and Pat Schroeder are pushing legislation. And then you wind up with people like Duckworth and uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, who are pressuring the Secretary of Defense to, to initiate studies of women in combat, to revisit uh, the, the policy itself. In 2015, the, the, the DOD repeals the policy. Uh, slide 41, this is an expansion of the, uh, the previous graph where I'd mentioned in 89, you get an uptick in public opinion that, that, that corresponds with an uptick in media coverage of women doing combat jobs in Panama and in the Gulf War. And then this again happens, as you can see, the, the media coverage goes down, becomes less of a novelty, less of a new thing, like, oh, women are in combat. Of course, they've been doing it since the 80s. But what you see, though, is a steady increase in public opinion, which is that gray line. It just keeps going up and up and up. And this is actually an aggregate um, average of polls. So some polls, by some organizations, you get around like 60, 55%, and some of them are even higher. But on average, roughly three quarters of Americans during the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, well, the Afghanistan was still going on, but during that era are more comfortable with when they're asked, do you support women being allowed to serve in combat? And they definitively say yes, for at least three quarters of the public. Uh, slide 20 on 42. Uh, this is not like I showed you generals and so on and so forth. They changed their minds. Uh, this is actually so the, the the woman who had the silver star and the, on the other slides. This is her commander, and I'm not going to read this off because you guys are able to read it too. But essentially, what uh, what Captain Linder is saying is, you know, I don't understand why gender is an issue. Clearly, the performance of this soldier should tell you that gender is irrelevant, like in, in her ability to to do what she did. On the next slide, on 43, uh, this is actually a general who was the chairman of the Joint, the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time of the repeal. He took a, a dramatic change in opinion. And actually, of all things, there's a small story of him being, I think, in Afghanistan or Iraq, and he's, he's getting driven around in a Humvee. And when he looks up in the turret, he can't tell who's up there. And at some point, he hears the soldier talking, and like, oh, that's, that's a woman. And it, had, it gave him this epiphany that he suddenly appreciated that how many women were doing how many jobs, like so many jobs in, in Iraq and Afghanistan? And he just kind of thought, why are we still supporting this policy? And he himself, in addition to members of Congress pushing Secretary of Defense to reexamine the policy, now the military themselves are also pushing for a change in the policy. 
Uh, I can skip ahead to slide 45. And so these are just some concluding remarks. Uh, again, some of this is they're here because it's part of a larger lecture. So I, I don't want to disc I want you to know I'm not discounting the fact that it requires a lot of changes in, in beliefs about women in general. So it's really difficult to remove this kind of story from, you know, we can't say that it's difficult to say this wouldn't have happened without suffrage and without women's rights movements and without the the powerful second, third, and fourth wave feminism movements that, that occurred in the United States. It also wouldn't have occurred without the repeal of, uh, or the development of an all volunteer force, so the end of the draft in the United States. And on the next slide, this is kind of a loose breakdown on, on slide 46 of, uh, minus, the, minus those terms about variables. Essentially, there's some stuff in here that, I'm not advocating that we should be promoting war for, for change in society, but what's important though is on those last two about changes in Congress and key leaders. These were things that this change in policy most likely would not have happened without people being willing to elect more women into Congress, without people being more willing to put women who were in Congress on committee assignments. And so when people like Pat Schroeder and Bev Byron and Tammy Duckworth were in the right place at the right time, when a war occurs, they're able to take advantage of, of that, that opportunity and they're able to, to change things for women. And so on this last slide, again, I just want to highlight how far along women have come in the armed forces. We're in the 1940s, there's this enlistment poster of, of, a, of, a, of a wave, who's not really in the Navy, she's in the waves, an auxiliary of the Navy. Her job is to release a man to go fight at sea. And now we have women who are graduating from ranger school. And what this overall tells us is that when you have people, when we're able to encourage greater diversity in our institutions and greater inclusiveness in our institutions, we're able to also then over time expose people to different possibilities, to what it's like to having women in even the most unlikely places. Or in other cases, it might reflect notions of race or sexuality or gender identity and so on and so forth. And that exposure when it's intense enough over a long enough period of time, it changes our norms and our beliefs and our values. And I think for the best. And that's a, that's a lesson I think that we can actually apply in a variety of areas in, in society, not just in the armed forces. Uh, with that said, I try my best to keep it around 20 minutes, but I know we also uh, ran late. Um, does anybody have any questions? And I'm sure we can also do this where uh, those who want you to leave really can leave really, and I'll linger around for questions as well. John, so, uh, you talked about the uh, the Integration Act, I think was in 1948, and you said that people couldn't uh, serve above the 